Hi, everybody. Good evening. Uh, we'll begin. In, I see a couple people who are signing at the um, check-in table, so if you be patient with us. Less than a minute. We should be getting started shortly. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and begin. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, if not, I can, we do have a, a mic. This is a relatively small room and I tend to speak loudly, so if at any time you can't hear me, just let me know and, and I'll make sure that um, we, we get the volume adjusted appropriately. Before I begin, I want to introduce myself. My name is Homer Garcia. I am the Acting Assistant Director for the Parks and Recreation Department. And we do have translation services available for tonight's public meeting on the Brackenridge Park Master Plan. And with that being said, we have uh, someone who wants to share a few words with us. Buenas noches a todos. Alguna persona que habla español y que quiere escuchar toda esta presentación en español, yo voy a ser el intérprete. Tengo aquí equipo para que puedan escuchar todo en español. Muy bien. Buenas noches. Thank you. Thank you. So um, tonight is five of six public meetings that we're having on the uh, Brackenridge Park Master Plan. And to provide a little bit of background, you know, I want to acknowledge uh, former Councilwoman Betty Osabo. She had uh, reached out to Councilman Trevino and, and shared with him that one of the things that we needed to do more of with regard to Brackenridge Park was be more engaging of the public. We, we did have two public meetings, but there, we were challenged, the Parks Department, to look to see how we can take this public meeting to the communities across town, so that making sure that we're capturing engagement across the entire city of San Antonio and everybody that uses the park. And so through the leadership of uh, Councilman Trevino, he's reached out to his colleagues, and together they've been supportive of helping us deliver these meetings. And so I want to um, acknowledge that leadership and, and thank him for that. And, and in doing so, um, you know, message was sent loud and clear to the Parks and Recreation Department. We needed to do more. And so we want to be responsive to that. And, and so in tonight's meeting, we'll walk through a um, handout. Does everyone have a handout that looks like this? It should have been on the sign-in table when you were coming in. What this captures is uh, the, basically the strategies and all the elements within each strategy for the Brackenridge Park Master Plan. And so outside in the breezeway, we do have much larger versions of this available for review so that you can ask direct questions of our project team and then we can make sure that we're providing you with the answers to the questions that you have. That, that's one of the things that we want to make certain we do is provide clear uh, information and make sure that there's no misinformation out there about what is happening with Brackenridge Park and through the master plan process. Um, before I get into my summary of this sheet, I want to acknowledge the Brackenridge Park Conservancy and Executive Director Lynn Bobbitt. Uh, I believe she has a few words that she'd like to share with the group. Lynn? I like the podium. <laughs> Good evening. Lynn Bobbitt, as he said. I see a few people that have come to the other meetings, so forgive me, but I'd like to tell those of you that I'm seeing tonight uh, a little bit about the Brackenridge Conservancy. It was formed in 2009 and it was done so to create an organization to be the advocate for the park, to be a steward of the park, to work in partnership with the city. The Conservancy has a memorandum of understanding under which we operate and it is administered by the Parks and Recreation Department. So uh, back in 2009, before you see the explosive development that is occurring along Broadway, the City Council, Parks Department, and the Conservation Society came together to encourage the formation of an organization such as this. We do not own the property. The property is still owned and managed by the City and the Parks and Recreation Department. However, we work with the Parks and Recreation Department and have been involved in the discussions for the development 
of an update of the only master plan that was created and adopted by City Council, and that was done in 1979. <coughs> so it is outdated. I would like to say that I appreciate the Council's action to move forward with an update. There has been a lot of conversation about parking and traffic, which Homer will go into, and I have listened carefully to those comments that have been made. But I would like to say that there are things that should be done and can be done in the park. Um, it was created in 1899. There is some deferred maintenance, such as rep rep uh, repairs of the river walls, uh, water quality, uh, the acequia from uh, um, 1779 could be redone, the old Spanish colonial dam and cover that. And there, I would like to call your attention to some of those things as Homer is talking. And I wanted to say that I am available to give a tour of the park. It is different when you're standing on site looking at the 120 acres that are still free and open to the public. The entire park is about 345 acres, but only um, a third of that is open and non-fee based. That means the rest of it is golf course, witty, zoo, and first tee. So the Conservancy is interested in protecting that open space and where possible to expand the open space. So I am going to pass around, start over here, and if you would put your name and email, I'd be happy to call you and do small groups of tours and uh, give you more information as we make our way through the park. I'm here tonight to answer questions as well. Thank you. And so um, the format of the meeting, let me, I guess, identify our uh, project team. Um, the lead is Jim Gray with Rialto Studios. If Jim, you'd raise your hand. Uh, John Mize on this side of the room. And TCI has been helping with this project as well. Jamal, if you please raise your hand. And is Eric in here? Eric's right next to him in red. So the format of the meeting, I'll go through and, and review this with you. After I'm done with um, the summary and overview, then there will be an opportunity for citizens that have signed up to speak. And citizens will be provided three minutes and groups provided nine minutes. And so at the conclusion of that, we have the large displays of, of what everyone has a copy here of tonight to allow you to roam through each of the strategy areas, look at the elements, ask questions of the project team, and then indicate um, through by placing a dot. So each strategy element has a, a scale at the bottom that allows you to indicate maybe some elements you think are really great and, and you strongly support, ranging to you know, kind of lukewarm and, and not really maybe resonates with you very, very much to it resonates with me and I really don't like this and city, I need you to go back and relook at this. So that's what the purpose of the visuals outside will serve. And again, our project team will be there to answer any questions as well as myself. So um, we'll go ahead and begin the presentation. And what, what I want to highlight is the um, master plan thus far it, it's a vision plan and does not equal or equate to implementation. At nowhere are we close to finalizing this plan and adopting a plan that the department can make a recommendation to council. We're still very much in the gathering public input phase. So I want to make certain that that's front and center. Um, and also, there, there's not any funding identified to this plan. And so once this process is done and identified and there's a final plan that can be forwarded for recommendation, then the other part's going to be where do we get the money from? And the truth is that that's not decided yet and, and we just don't know. Um, what you see here are merely concepts. They are not design elements. It is not about um, the color of a park sign or the theme or logo associated with a park sign or anything like that. We, these are purely just strategies and, and, if you will, much smaller visions on how to deliver a larger project. Unfortunately, what's been part of the challenge is we're not working with a blank slate. If this was a fresh park acquisition, then, you know, kind of sky's the limit, but that's not where we're at. The fact is Breckenridge Park is uh, 
an old park, a large park. It's in the heart of the city, and there's a lot of people that identify with that park and, and have a lot of ties to the park. And so in going through this process, it's critical that the project team in the city are considerate of all those elements. At the end of the day, um, the park use will not change. There's no discussion about charging fees and in, in this plan, and it does not address programming. So at the end of the day, those are elements, kind of implementation elements, operational elements, that would maybe, at that's the time that that discussion's had. But at this point, at no um, time has there been thoughts of, you know, how are we gonna program something? That's not been the focus or goal of this um, master plan process. The goal is, however, to protect, preserve, and restore the rich cultural and historical landscape of the park. And that needs to be the overarching theme as we move through this process for our design team. And that's kind of been um, the baseline, if you will. And looking at the end of the day, through these strategies, are we doing those things? And that's critical to delivering a project that can be recommended and supported by the public. So um, I'll begin with uh, this document that everyone has here. And if you don't, please raise your hand. One of our project team members will get you a copy. So you'll see as we go through these five strategy areas, some of them kind of bleed together and somewhat have a domino effect. And, and so uh, when you'll hear some recurring themes, so if you would please you know, be patient, but again, it, it's with the mind of protecting the cultural and, and historical landscape of Brackenridge Park. So number one, strategy number one, increase visibility and pedestrian access to and within the park. So within this strategy, there are three primary elements that we're asking for feedback and input on. Number one, create a common park entrance. So there's multiple ways people access Breckenridge Park. And if you're local, you may know how to get to the park. If you're a tourist, maybe not so. And it's very easily you're coming up north on Broadway and people pass the park. And so they don't know that. So one of the things that the project team had identified was creating a common theme or almost a brand, if you will, for the park so that you know when you've arrived at Breckenridge Park, similar to like this park we're here in this evening, Harburger Park. Uh, number two, or strategy, excuse me, number two, element number two, excuse me, in the strategy area. Increase park connections to the neighborhoods and the Broadway corridor. During the evaluation uh, of the project team, when they were looking at just connectivity to the surrounding areas of Brackenridge Park, they noted that there are poor overall connections and that there's opportunity to improve that and, and strengthen those um, inroads, if you will, to the immediate community and then along that Broadway corridor. Number three, element number three, add multi-use pathways to increase pedestrian flow. So what this element highlights in the visual is the red line, and that's the recommended path for where there's opportunity to do that. And at, at the end of the day, what we've created is for the, you know, looking at enhancing the user environment, making sure that there's safe pedestrian flow north and south, east and west within the park. And so that, that's the thought behind um, this element. Strategy number two, recapture green space and lube impervious cover and parking. So there's four elements here that uh, we're seeking public input on. First element is reducing interior parking and excess impervious cover to increase green space. So as you know, visitors of the park are aware, there's a spattering of parking spaces throughout the park, but there's opportunity to look at how we can modify those park spaces and eliminate the impervious cover and, and, and in the end recapture some green space. And this is with the thought of kind of alleviating some of those stress points within the park that today users experience. Element two, 
established parking garages outside of the park perimeter. This identifies the potential and this map highlights areas possibly where garages could be erected. This is not on parkland and it, there's been no discussion about where that would happen specifically. These are just options. And then again, back to the operations implementation. If it happens, who's gonna run it? What are the fees? None of that has been the focal point of discussion and in developing the strategy. Again, it was about how do we look at preserving uh, the current state of the park, improving it, enhancing user experience so that there's safer flow north and south and east and west within the park. Related to that is element number three, convert St. Mary's parking lot to a grand lawn. This refers to the existing parking lot where the Brackenridge Eagle train depot station is. And so by eliminating that, having parking on the perimeter of the park, um, then that allows you effectively to enlarge the park by recapturing green space, similar to reducing that impervious cover at key uh, stress points within the park. This is one location where in doing so, then you return and restore that area to a place that really kind of becomes a heart of the park, allows people to congregate and interact and, and build community. This does not address programming and, and how else this Grand Lawn, should this element be supported, what it would look like and how it would be used. The fourth element, provide a people mover to connect to points of interest in and around the park. So you'll notice this inset is similar to the second one about where potentially there could be some garages constructed on the perimeter. And one of the things that we know is people still want to access the park. They want to be able to go where they want to go, whether it's Lambert Beach or the Witty or the zoo. Um, so what this allows is how we get people from location to location to points of interest that are critical and important to them. Strategy number three, restore natural park features and improve water quality. So, you know, we go back to protect, preserve, restore the, the historical and cultural landscape of the park. And, and this, in part, is tied to that. And so we all know that the park has a lot of um, natural features that uh, can use some attention. And so the first element talks about restoring and stabilize San Antonio riverbanks. Uh, when Lynn introduced the conservancy to everybody, she talked about how some of that's occurring now, but there's a lot more that needs to be done. I mean, the river flows entirely through the park. And so while we do engage in those maintenance activities today, we know that there's more that can be done. Along the east side of the park is the Catalpa Pershing, which, you know, this kind of provides uh, this design element, this inset. You look at how, what it is now versus maybe what it could be. And so by restoring it to a natural design with pedestrian walks, it still allows to serve the, the functional purpose in, of conveying water, but does so in a way that is much more integrated with the park, appears seamless, and then again allows the community the recreational opportunity to get north and south along this portion of the park. Uh, element number three, remove invasive plant species. This is not an item that is unique to uh, Breckenridge Park. We have it in all of our parks. We have it here at Harburger Park. And so, you know, we look at how we can eliminate those invasive species. And again, going back to restoring nature and, and you know, effectively loving Mother Earth and, and, and making sure that we're good stewards of the park that we're charged with maintaining. Element number four. This is uh, incorporating low impact development features. So one of the things we want to make sure is any new development in the park that we do so in a way that in, uh, incorporates low impact design elements and whether it's new improvements or looking at opportunities where maybe we have some projects where we can retrofit and introduce this to the park. We want to make sure that this is a guiding element in how we move forward with any improvements that, that we do. Strategy number four, 
restore, preserve, and articulate park cultural and historical features. So this ties directly to the goal and what we're trying to achieve. There are several elements that uh, can help achieve that. First being establishing the park as a national historic landmark and become the first national heritage area in Texas. And so effectively what this does is it raises the profile of the park and allows the city to possibly seek grant funding and leveraging resources to deliver more to the community, um, all in the context of still preserving and respecting the cultural and historical landscape of the park. Um, element number two, restore and interpret Spanish colloquial dams, acequias, and waterworks. So this inset highlights the north end of the park where there's a, a lot and an abundance of these resources. And so when we tell the story about how the park was once used to how it is today, that captures the, the I guess, how cultures have changed over time in, in interacting with the park and that it's always part of building that community. Element number three, 4C, restore historic buildings and structures. So there's a lot of already existing structures in the park um, that also can use some improvements and the project team felt that in making sure that we preserve what the park has today, that we look at, we do that instead of just going and building something new and then forgetting about the old. Create an outdoor classroom. Every park setting is an opportunity for a classroom setting. And we know that Brackenridge Park is being used today as a form for education. This would identify an area of the park and formalize that opportunity so people kind of know and come when you're here, whether it's an outdoor classroom or an amphitheater or what have you, that this is a place where learning and education occurs. The other is uh, renovating Sunken Garden Theater. It is the home to uh, fiesta events and concerts throughout the year. And, you know, but other than that, doesn't you know, get a whole lot of use. So how do we look at and how can we better integrate the Sun Garden Theater with the park? Strategy number five, reduce vehicular traffic to improve pedestrian mobility. And so this is one of those examples where there's kind of a you know, domino effect. Um, and you know, one thing that's critical to know as we go through these uh, last set of elements is you know, this is not so that access is restricted to the park, rather other elements within the master plan identify alternatives for how we can still get people to those points of interest. And as far as critical roads for conveyance of um, uh, pedestrian, or excuse me, public vehicular traffic on special events, then those roads would be open. The roads aren't being torn out, the roads aren't going away. It's just how do we utilize those roads on an everyday basis versus a special event basis and still allowing public to utilize that for access to other points within the park. So the first element is improve the intersection at Stadium Drive and Hildebrand Avenue to establish a main entrance for the park and zoo. So we go back to the very beginning, we talked about there are multiple ways for how people get to the park and how do you know you've arrived at the park? This is an opportunity to formalize that entrance and rather than have people come from off of Broadway and using um, all the park roads to get to the other side, this would allow people to enter to, excuse me, to formally come enter the park off of um, Hildebrand Avenue and then people know we've arrived at the park and, and it's an opportunity to also utilize that as the main entrance to the zoo. We know the zoo has a lot of visitors and so do they all need to be coming up uh, across Mulberry or up St. Mary's as opposed to having again a formal entrance pulls that traffic out, allows people to, again, safer passage for those that are on pedestrians or you know, running groups or walking groups, whatever the case may be. Second element, close the Hildebrand Avenue entrance and Breckenridge Way at Tulita Drive to restrict vehicular access 
in the northern area of the park. So this is that area where we know we have a lot of rich cultural uh, resources that we want to make sure we protect, preserve, and restore. And so in, in, by closing and eliminating this entrance, this allows us to accomplish that. It redirects, again, traffic from entering the park at this location further up Hildebrand. And at, at the end of the day, knowing those roads will be there, we talked about public vehicular access on special events. When we look at implementation for any of these elements, should we get to that point, then those are one of the things that we look at. We want to make sure that there's still public access on days and, and in times of the year that really require it and people can get exactly to the amenity they want to be at without having to walk a long, a long, um, walk a long way, excuse me. Um, C and D, these talk about mid-block turnarounds. Uh, one is on Red Oak and the other is on Tulita and St. Mary's. So again, when we go back and look to how people typically maybe come to the zoo, they're going to drive up St. Mary's, or they're going to come down on um, uh, Tulita. And so what these mid-block turnarounds allow is for pickup, drop off, that type of thing. But again, it kind of keeps traffic out of what is right now a, a point of congestion, one of the stress points in the park. And then 5E, close Avenue A to public vehicular traffic. And so this allows that portion of uh, uh, Avenue A to become a pedestrian walk and somewhat of a natural area. And so um, this, these five elements is what would support how we promote pedestrian safety in the park as well as enhance the user environment. But not just these, really collectively, all of the strategies that we've reviewed and presented here this evening. So that concludes my presentation. I want to uh, reiterate to everybody, nothing has been decided. That's why we're having these meetings. And we want to make sure that for these strategies, if there's something that uh, maybe one of the elements you like, we want to hear it. If there's an element that you don't like, we want to hear it. And there's, if there's something that we have not thought about, then let us know. Provide, provide us with that information today. Um, once I'm done, we'll get into the citizens that sign up to speak shortly. But I'll be here to answer any questions. We have our project team here as well to answer questions. As everybody signed in, we also have comment cards. And I encourage everybody to, to write one out. I assure you, everything that is said this evening during public uh, comment period, we've got somebody recording that. And um, all the comment cards that are filled out and put in the box, we're capturing all of that data as well. We have iPads. If somebody uh, just wants to complete a survey based on this information, you're able to complete that on iPad. So we want to make sure that we're reaching out to everybody in a way that um, works for them. And for those that do take the iPad survey, it is identical to this. There is nothing different on that survey that is presented here. It lists the strategy, the design element, and then it has the drop down box that has the same exact scale that you'll see outside. So if you know there's not a need to review that and you know kind of the public comment or the excuse me, the comment you want to provide us, then by all means use the survey click on the right button and you're good to go. But um, at the end, we'll stick around. We'll make sure that any questions that are answered, we will be here uh, to provide the clarification that's needed so that everybody's comfortable with what we're doing moving forward. And in closing, I wanna highlight that we have one final public input meeting and that is next week on uh, July 13th at the Ramirez Community Center. So if you have neighbors that wanted to attend and couldn't be here this evening, then we're asking, please get the word out, let them know. Uh, and then our charge at the end is to work with the project team to tabulate all this information, all of this feedback, all of the comments over the course of six meetings and come back and revisit this and look at what needs to change. And then from there, a final uh, master plan would be developed for parks to recommend to a council subcommittee and then see where it goes from there.
So um, that concludes my summary of the five strategies for the Braston Park Breckenridge Park Master Plan. And I've got a list here of individuals signed up to speak. And uh, the first one is Jacob Middleton. I just had a question. I've seen some articles that called the park underutilized. Um, was that part of the reason for the redevelopment? So when, um, when we look at the reason why we're doing this, as our, or excuse me, Lynn Bobbitt had pointed out, the, there's, the existing master plan for the park is antiquated and outdated. Um, the reason for this is actually funding was appropriated in the FY15 budget to come up with a master plan. So we're just implementing the policy decision to fund that and see at the end of the day, do we have a plan that ultimately we can come back with and recommend it. So that's the reason for doing the master plan is making sure that we're delivering that, that project that we were tasked with doing, and, but doing so in a manner that is engaging the public. And so that's why we're doing these, these additional meetings. Um, as I pointed out, former Councilwoman Betty Osabo you know, made it clear that we need to do more. And through the leadership of Councilman Trevino and his colleagues, we're stepping up to that. We want to be responsive and make sure that at the end of the day, we're providing a plan that can be supported by the community. <coughs> Second signed up to speak is Isabel Garcia. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I just have a letter to read on behalf of Green Spaces Alliance. Okay. Yes, would you mind standing up, ma'am, please? We are, and, and so I probably should have started out with this. We are recording the meeting as well, so we want to make sure that the, there will be a uh, video that will be uploaded to YouTube that highlights and shows tonight's public meeting. So if you will, please. All right. Uh, my name is Isabel Garcia, and I'm the chair of the Advocacy Committee for Green Spaces Alliance. And this is a letter that uh, we'd like to read into the public record. The mission of Green Spaces Alliance is to sustain the natural environment and enhance urban spaces through land conservation, community education, uh, and engagement. By protecting undeveloped land and water resources, cultivating urban green spaces and community, and educating the next generation about the environment we depend on, we can help ensure a better quality of life now and in the years to come. San Antonio is one of the fastest growing cities in the United States, with regional population growth projected to almost double in the next 50 years. Urban growth, without careful planning and preservation, will, dis will disrupt the quality of life for all unless we plan for future development. But Brackenridge Park is a case in point. Established in 1899 and located below the headwaters of the San Antonio River, Brackenridge Park is an historic natural resource in an urban setting that serves the citizens of the city of San Antonio in many ways. As a green refuge for recreation and physical activities, as an outdoor venue for community gatherings and special occasion celebrations, and as a place where citizens and visitors alike go to learn about and or remember the value and meaning of the river that runs through it. Today, however, the encroaching demands of private development in the surrounding area threaten to erode the boundaries of the park and the amount of its acreage. Green Spaces Alliance believes that the proposed Brackenridge Park Master Plan provides a positive and workable framework for managing several of the issues that must be addressed now and in the coming years. These issues include improving the water quality of the river, managing and improving the habitat of the flora and the fauna, restoring and or repurposing historic building elements, <coughs> restoring the San Antonio River Channel and the Catawba Persian Channel to a more natural state, and how to better direct and limit vehicular pedestri pedestrian and alternative modes of transport through the park. However, the Brackenridge Park Master Plan must be sensitive to and strike a balance between the restoration and improvement of natural resources in the park and the historic and current view of Brackenridge Park as an urban park available for the public use of all of the citizens of San Antonio. Proposed new areas such as the Great Lawn must not limit traditional uses 
such as family barbecues, picnics, recreational activities, and special occasion celebrations. If public perception is that the proposed master plan is targeting a different demographic than it does today, the support of current and future users will be limited and be diminished. Other concerns include the major and still problematic issue of how to address and implement solutions to the vehicular traffic issues in and around the park. This issue is the least resolved in the plan. Additionally, the ongoing presence of the feral cat population in the park requires the implementation of the general measures outlined in the plan and the inclusion of more proactive measures in order to ensure the health and well-being of the park's wildlife, the birds, rodents, rabbits, squirrels, snakes, etc. In conclusion, Green Spaces Alliance congratulates the City of San Antonio and their many partners for putting together such a comprehensive and well-considered plan for the preservation and the future development of San Antonio's beloved urban green gem. We applaud the focus of natural elements and water quality enhancements and encourage the, the further development of strategies to build a broad public support base that emphasizes stewardship of the park while focusing on education and community <coughs> involvement in regard to environmental issues. Thank you. Thank you. Would, would you like me to take that so we enter that into the record? Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, actually, I wrote some stuff on that. But That's fine. If I can get it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Next is Mifey Moore. You want me to speak from back here? If you feel comfortable, ma'am, or if you want, you could come. Okay. Thank you. I think the process should be started over and it should involve better the real users of the park. I go every day to the park. I live across the street from it. I walk two miles there every day. Yesterday I walked the entirety of the Catalpa Pershing Canal, which is gorgeous. Texas law says that whoever of the owners use and invest the most in their land own it the most. And the working class people that I see every day when I walk in the park own it the most. Um, they have been denied due process uh, in this master plan. Um, $250,000 of our taxpayer money has been spent for the architects and the planners and the discussers of what to do with our park. They had their first meeting in July of 2015, but they didn't have a second meeting until April of 2016, and that was supposed to be the last meeting but there was a big uproar about it so they planned six more meetings you figure altogether there were eight meetings there was only one in West San Antonio and only is going to be one in the far south of San Antonio who are most of the users of the park they are who I see every day I have handed out yesterday my hundred and fiftieth flyer to the users that I see every day in the park and I have yet to hand a flyer to somebody who said I know I heard all about it this is just terrible None of them know this is coming or this is being planned. Um, there's supposed to be a wrap-up meeting and I hope we're all going to be advised of it and guaranteed that we get to attend the wrap-up meeting after that last meeting next week. Um, I think the, to, to deny access to the most frequent users, not allowing cars in Brackenridge Park, uh, abuses their rights. I think using their money to run people, including me, out of my park when I want to drive through my park it is not the right thing to do. I think they should start over and involve more the real users of the park. As she mentioned a minute ago, there's been damage to the public lands that we all own, mostly by private profiteers. Main Plaza lost all those gorgeous heritage trees. You don't have access to the water features there. Hemisphere Park is now being ruined and scraped <coughs> for what I think are illegal hotels will go, private hotels will go on your public land. The Institute of Texan Cultures is said to be getting torn down and the federal building torn down. They tried to build apartments out by Mission San Jose. They have taken away the golf course at Brackenridge. It is now used by a privateer, and he the, his lease expires next year. I think we should take the golf course back, and you can make your grand lawn over there. Give it back to the taxpayers. <laughs> Good call. <laughs> that's a, that's a po positive idea. 
Anyway, uh, there's just too much privateering going on. I think you should start over and you should involve the users, and I'm going to finish this last sentence. If you want to fix the streets, you can remove the asphalt and you can install pavers or gravel or grass. We could mow the streets in Gra Brackenridge Park. That would be marvelous for the greenness of the park. But you cannot say people cannot drive their cars through their park. That is unrealistic to expect working class people to park in a Pape Dawson garage and ride a tram to go have a picnic. That's just unrealistic, and it's not fair to the owners. And as I had said once or twice before, forgive me, I must say, do not run me out of my park when I want to drive through my park, or you're going to open a can of whoop-ass. <laughs>
think the idea of closing the accesses to cars is a terrible idea, and it's to me it's clearly an idea by people who don't use the park. Uh, we can call them locals, except I live too far from here, but I drive down here, and I'm not going to drive and ride in a, in a little bus over to the park. All you're going to do is you're going to drive people away from the park and then we'll go to a different park. That shouldn't be our focus. Uh, I saw an item in the paper about a prospective $150 million. What a laugh. If we could just have some money to pave the roads that are in the park now, or to put nice gravel roads in, or some kind of smooth paths, it would be wonderful, because right now, if you're running through the park, or jogging, or riding a bike, you almost take your ankles at, at, at total risk. There's ruts, there's crevasses, uh, it's hard to run in these roads because no money is spent. Upgrading the park to me, first of all, would be let's get some nice smooth surfaces for people to bike on and walk on. Uh, a lot of our people, when I go run with my 50 to 100 people, a lot of them aren't runners, they're walkers. And a lot of them are pushing baby buggies. And they're bouncing around on those terrible roads back there. But the Hildebrand e entrance is where a lot of us come into the park and it should not be closed. They talk about the danger. Come on, I've been 31 years now. I haven't had any danger. I wait till the traffic is empty and then I drive out. It's only a problem if you've got a contract with the city and you're trying to dream up new projects. We don't need it. There's an article in the paper 10 days ago by a guy named Gene Elder. Uh, yes. Made all the sense in the world. We have a nice, hospitable park. Don't mess with it. Leave it alone. Go somewhere else. Okay. Now, other parts of the park, the South <coughs> Park, maybe over by the Great, where they have the Grand Plaza or whatever. Most of us aren't over there. I don't know how that deals with the zoo and their parking. But at least for the part that's off of between Mulberry and Broadway and Hildebrand, that's where people are enjoying the park. They're picnicking out there, which I've done many times. And I go there, at the end of our runs, most of us go over to our cars, which fortunately are there. We take off our sweaty clothes, we put on drier clothes from our trunk, we get our little mini pack of beer, and we all go and we socialize afterwards for an hour or two there in the park on picnic tables. Uh, it's legal on our side of the river, uh, not on the other side, uh, but it's a social occasion as well. And then when it's dark, we go home. Uh, we don't want to be riding trams. It's a bad idea. It needs to be just scratched and shouldn't even be talked about anymore. It's, it's a no-go. Thank uh, you. I won't talk anymore. <laughs> I work with the city, so I, I don't want the cameras on me. Uh, oh, it is Mark. It's amazing. <laughs> Are you Mark Sullivan? Yes, sir. So, uh, back to the drawing board. Really. I mean, uh, I don't know who what the genesis of this plan is, but it appears to be motivated by some developers who want to spend money and make money. So the plan, the details of the plan are fraught with myriad defects. So I request humbly that the uh, Parks Department shelf this entire plan and do some things that the park needs. There are, there are several things the park needs, but they're not in this plan. Um, thank you all for being here. You're taking out your time from your families and your lives because you care. And that's why I'm here. I care about this park. And I care about our city. And um, I appreciate your energy and your time and your consideration for what, uh, what's, what's trying to be accomplished here. Um, I think the plan is, is quite misguided in, on several levels. 
Um, I think we could do a lot better. And um, thank you. Thank you. I just got here. I got caught with multiple accidents and a lot of construction, so sorry I'm late. Um, but I also cut through Brackenridge Park coming over here, and I watched families sitting at picnic tables with their children. I watched runners. I watched bikers, bicyclists. I saw people driving up, getting out of their vehicle, walking over very close by to a picnic table in all parts of the park and enjoying the park. I also came out here several days ago to make sure I knew where I was going because this is not a park that I normally use. You know what? I went right past the entrance. There's no grand entrance. Turned around, came back, and came on in. Walked around, found this, and then I thought, okay, I'm going to go check out the other end of the park. So I got on Wurzbach Parkway, went around, went to the other end of the park, and drove in. And there are a couple of entrances. Again, no big signage. And guess what I found? Picnic tables that you could drive right up to <laughs> and have access to. So, <laughs> look up the word hypocrisy. There is a disconnect between what the users of parks want and what the design proposes. Yes, I agree with several others. Brackenridge does need some work on it. It's an old park, but it's a people's park. And we need to ditch this plan completely and look at repairing those areas that need our TLC, that needs TLC, and not restrain people from being able to access their park. Parks are supposed to be accessible, <coughs> not an obstacle course. And I found it was really interesting when I looked at the northern part of this park, and the very things they want to do away with with this plan are the very things they implemented on the northern part of this park. City of San Antonio, think about it. Thank you. So based on the sign-in sheets, that is the last individual signed up to speak. Is there anybody that I missed? or anybody that would like to share some words? Yes, ma'am, can I get your name, please, My so name I can? Is June Johnson. June Johnson? Yes. Would you mind standing up, please? Not at all, I'll stand up here. Um, I, I think when I came to the meeting, I expected maybe a few more details than, uh, you know, we talked about taking the trams, but, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of detail about how are you gonna accommodate for for strollers, uh, ice chests, uh, things like this. Um, the parking situations, you know, I know the map shows it here, but I would have liked in this meeting to really talk about specific locations. Um, also, is the plan that the city has, I mean, we're gonna, someone's gonna have to pay for this parking spot. So is the park user going to have to pay for the parking in these parking garages only to be shuttled to the park? Um, I agree with most of what people are saying that are, that are opposed to the upgrades. I do understand that, yes, San Antonio is growing. Perhaps we should, as one person suggested, uh, acquire the property, the, the golf course. That would add to the jogging trail. That would, if they've got natural trees out there. Yes. I mean, you know, that would be an expansion of the park, which is, I think, what we need because, unfortunately, like you said, we are bound, with, we have boundaries around the park. But as a person who has five little ones rolling around, you take a stroller, you try to accommodate them, trying to get, you know, all, you know, I may not take all five at one time, but, you know, taking the nie nieces and nephews. And getting on a trolley with you know water bottles and all kinds of things, I just can't see doing that. It would be much, it's much more even now going to the zoo or going up St. Mary's to access the park to get to the they have that playground near the uh, the so just to get to there. I mean we have to walk and I I granted we have to be cautious of cars, but it is a walk to try to control little ones, and most people that are going to use a park are usually going to be families who have little ones. So uh, making it more difficult for them to get access to the park to me is, is not 
but I just can't see it. Now, we used it. They put a big old parking garage up at the end of Toledo, and you come down the hill. Of course, pushing those those uh, strollers up the hill is, you know, after a long day of walking around can be trying, but um, I just don't see how right now in all the things that you're proposing, except for the upgrades and the maintenance of, of the different, uh, uh, the acequia, et cetera, the, the buildings there, uh, I don't see how this is viable. I really don't see how it's viable to put parking everywhere, but uh, I agree with another person who made the statement that you probably have less use of the park by doing that because you don't have easy, quick <coughs> access to the park. You have to wait for a trolley to get you there in 10 minutes, however long it takes, depending on where the parking lot is. That's the extent of my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jensen. Um, yes, ma'am, did you also? I would like to make a comment. I didn't sign up. Okay, may I? You, you can. Could Thank you give me your name, please, so I could check it off? Pardon? Could you give me your name, please, yes, so I could? My name is Kate. My last name is Quartz. Okay. C-O-R-D-P-S. Okay, do you want to come up to the front? Okay. okay. And I'll be very quick. That's fine. I think I'm just going to add one, one little thing. Sure. I mean, I, I think no one argues with the idea of green spaces. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the green space, and I don't see why parking lots cannot be converted to pervious materials. I mean, they're right out here, you know? I mean, we come to this park all the time. There's tons of them out here, and they're not hard to park on. Uh, I think having a parking garage where people have to go pay to go to the park, you know, I mean, I don't like paying for parking garages, but I can afford it. And I think there are many citizens in San Antonio who not only can't afford it, but they're not going to ever be able to go to that park again. I'm a San Antonio native. I've been going there since I was you know, in my parents' arms, and I think that would be terrible, terrible, terrible thing to do to that park. I go there a couple times a week to meet with my dog, our little doggy friends, and we go walk through the park, and we have a wonderful time. The idea of trying to get my dog out of the car in the garage and get him through the garage without getting run over, he hates cars anyway, down a walk on a people mover. He wouldn't get on it anyway, and would you let a dog on a people mover, you know? He's a dog. Um, you know, that, you see tons of people with their dogs there, and I, you know, how are you ever going to do this? Half the people there are walking their dogs, not letting the runners run into them, you know? I mean, we're trying not to trick the runners. Uh, you know, I just cannot. Many of our runners have dogs yes, that run of course, with them. Yes, of course they do, and my we dog loves seeing them. <laughs> and he likes the little kids in the strollers. He thinks they're wonderful. So I, I just think this would totally negate every wonderful thing about that park that I've known in my 62 years. And I think it would be a terrible, terrible thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else before we close the citizen signed up to speak portion? Y yes, ma'am. May I get your name, please? Margaret. Okay. Zillow. Okay. Would you like to come to the front, Margaret? I didn't plan this. <laughs> but I did come to the meeting because uh, I was very concerned when I heard there would be no more cars in the park. So I thought, well, I'll give them a fair chance. But I'm going to say I have a memory of my mother, age 95. Uh, I, we went after, after I'd take her for an appointment, we'd always go pick up some fast food and go somewhere or just sit down and eat. But we decided to go to Brackenridge Park. And it was just a wonderful little memory of her at the park. She had her little, you know, red stroller, red roller, and we were able to get the food on the table and get her to the table and just enjoy a little picnic. And uh, so she loved it because she grew up near Brackenridge Park. Um, she owned that house up until six or seven months ago when she passed away. And, um, you know, she would reminisce about the time she would ride horses at the park. She'd reminisce about when she, you know, could swim in the river. And I had a grandfather who was a San Antonio police officer, and one of his last duties when he was old was to be the policeman at the swimming hole. So I have memories of parties at the pavilion, uh, but the main thing is my mother got to go when she was 95 and frail, have a picnic on a picnic table, and we pulled up right there on the spur of the moment. So th that would never happen if we couldn't have cars. Thank you. Thank you. Most of the parks do not provide adequate play equipment and equipment that is safe 
also. I have noticed that because I take my grandkids, my grandchildren, and my great-grandchild, and uh, several parks do not have water fountains, or they're out of order, and uh, they only have one place where they can play, and most of it is unsafe because there's so many children, and they don't have a chance to use the equipment, and they, uh, they don't have a chance to have to stand in line and wait. And all these parents are frustrated, and that's their only chance that they get to play and be themselves and run around. And um, the one that's at Lions Club, they do not have uh, enough play equipment. The San Pedro Park has four swings for babies. And that's all they have on one side, the opposite side. They have a slide, a small slide, a big slide, and just a few little items where they can run up and down. And that's not sufficient. And that's, that's my complaint, that they do not have sufficient equipment for the children. They might have stuff for the, for the dogs because they've had that at Travis Park. They have uh, uh, fenced-in equipment for the dogs, but they have nothing for the children. That's my complaint. Thank, thank you, Ms. Stevens. You're welcome. Okay, so um, that concludes the citizens signed up to speak portion. Again, uh, our project team members will be outside on the breezeway to answer any specific questions about the strategies or any of the elements within each strategy. And I'll be available here uh, as well to answer any questions. If uh, there's a need for a men's or ladies room, it's out this door and it's a first set of doors on the right. We have comment cards outside as well. I had mentioned earlier, we have iPads here and water in the back of the room. So um, again, feel free to step outside and that's where they have the dots for those that want to indicate their level of support. Thank you everybody. Thank you.